All right, but now we've got just a few more minutes to close out the day and get to have a closing conversation with Renee Fleming and Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson. And I'm so honored to get to have this conversation with you both. So first of all, uh, I mean, you all, we've seen you in action today, but we also know a bit about your work locally, nationally, as artists, policymakers, and just, you know, all of the roles that so many of us have are extremely busy in the work that we do. But with your uh, national focus, time must be one of your most precious assets. And yet you are here with us today. So can you just tell us a little bit, why does arts and health matter? Why does the summit matter to you today? Listen, I found this conversation today so extremely inspiring. I mean, starting this morning um, with the story about, uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Lisa Wong who was talking about uh. the young schizophrenic man and how she reached him through drawing and they just drew every day. So I was just given a gift this little girl was sat down next to me and she didn't have anything to do and I gave her my green pen and she s gave this back and said, this is for you. So this is what you're all doing. Those of you who work in arts and health, you're giving a gift to the people that you serve, to the people that you're helping and they give back because what a wonderful feeling that is. I, I was also so inspired by um, Laura Trejo's uh, notion of one person just if one person smiles at her and, and you know that she knows that some program that she's working on it made a difference. So, but I, I come to this from my own work as an artist, of course, and, uh, uh, and, and the difficulties I had uh, with performance pressure and what it did to my body, the pain that I felt as a kind of a, a hedge against uh, performance anxiety or distraction and dealing with that and also stage fright and it got me interested and seven years ago or I met Dr. Francis Collins and in 2017 we had our first convening at the NIH we're having another one this fall to really look at the research and since then I mean really in the last five years um, it's exploded the interest the number of people and this type of gathering helps us all come together and work together so, and of course, I'm just, I'm starstruck that you're here today because the NEA does so much across the country in so many different ways. And Sunil Iyengar has been an incredible colleague. Um, of course, Ann Baker too. We have just, yes, there's Sunil, head of research for the NEA. Uh, so we turn to him for really all the smart language on everything we do. So I, I just, um, I think this program, it's the only opera house that I know of in the world who's doing this work. And uh, we should, all arts organizations should do this. And all researchers should reach out to performing arts organizations like Asal Habibi did, because you don't know who's going to say yes, we want the research. Thank you. Amazing. Dr. Jackson. Well, that was a wonderful response, Renee. Um, I, you know, I will say the ability to understand um, our full humanity is something that is so important. And there aren't many prisms through which to do that. And I'm so um, encouraged and excited that health is becoming one of those prisms and that the arts are central to understanding how to think of ourselves as whole people again. Um, in my own work, again, with a lot of focus on historically marginalized communities that, as part of their history, have been dehumanized. Um, their humanity has been diminished. Their ability to um, think of themselves as whole individuals and whole communities has been tampered with. Uh, so the ability to heal that and to do that through the prism of health or public health in part, I think it's just, it's an enormous opportunity um, that's ours to lose if we don't seize it. Um, the other part was that, again, this is home. Uh, to, so to see this happen in Los Angeles um, is extraordinary. Uh, and to see this kind of leadership and this kind of drive and imagination, I think is really inspiring. Thank you. Oh my goodness. I just goosebumps with this. Uh, it's so powerful. Um, the notion of healing, but also thinking of that at scale 
and even the choice of words, right, that, that something has been sort of tampered with because innately we are whole, but then it gets tampered with. And so how do we then use the arts to kind of come back to who we are? Um, so I, I grew up with the arts at, from age four, dancing, and it was really a part of my life. It's part of who I am. It's my career. It's my identity. It's so much. But it wasn't until I got into these jobs that I started realizing this is also a connection to things like arts and health, arts and well-being, arts and the economy. When did it first dawn on you, either personally or professionally? Renee, you were talking a little bit about the stage fright, which is the first time I've ever heard this remarkable uh, uh, artist talk about this. But when did it first dawn on you, really, that there was a connection between arts and health, either personally or in your professional life? Well, I was working in Chicago, actually, for a while as a, 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 a kind of a, an advisor to the opera company. And I, I noticed, first of all, that donors were in, involved in both arts and health. Mm. And so I got to tour the Ability Lab, Shirley Ryan's on the Kennedy Center board. So I was introduced to health in that way. But it really, um, it developed from exactly what I said, from my own um, issues. Mind-body connection was something that I started reading a lot about. As a performer, um, we need to, to kind of really be connected. And early in my career, it was really not acknowledged by medicine at that time that there was a connection between the mind and the body. It's hard to imagine today. And, um, and then I, I just followed the science. So this started appearing in the paper. And I said, to, when I met Francis Collins, I said, why are researchers studying music? I mean, really, literally, don't they have better things to do? And, um, you know, when he set me straight, he talked about the brain and needing to understand the brain. And, and so that's where so much of this comes from. But then there's a much greater kind of social narrative that's at work now, the, the mental health crisis that we face, the, 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 the shredding of our social fabric. I think the arts can make a big difference in, in these issues if we're allowed to embed, and that's, I, that's a word that I, I'm putting a lot of importance on as a, because of today, into our institutions. The, the arts should not just be in healthcare, but in all of our institutions. Mm. Nice. Yes. yes. Dr. Jackson. Yeah, for me, I don't know that, that um, so there, there was a very organic recognition at an early age that uh, when I was around family elders who often had ailments, and would talk about them all the time. Um, that when there was music, when there was dancing, um, when there was creative expression, somehow all of that was relieved. Mm. And as a kid, I, don't, I wouldn't know to say, oh, that's a connection between arts and health, but I knew that people who were elderly, that I cared about, who I knew were in pain or had ailments or things that they were dealing with, that when they were involved in, you know, I don't even know if I would have called it art then, they were just, you know, singing, dancing, and doing their thing, that there was relief there, that there was something was different, something had changed. So there, there was something that was a very early kind of organic recognition about the, that connection. And then, you know, later in, um, in my own career as I studied neighborhoods and quality of life issues and this kind of thing, the role of the arts became more important for lots of other reasons where um, you could have neighborhoods that were disinvested and um, poor, but they were culturally rich and that meant something and that's not to say that we would turn a blind eye to economic development needs, but it is to say that we had to recognize that there were assets in those communities, and often those assets were cultural. Um, and people could grow up um, and be um, find their way uh, because of that cultural anchoring that uh, may not exist in every place. So it, it somehow, I suppose, could mitigate some of those other deficiencies, right? So those are some ideas related to the question. I love it. And, and this just incredibly astute, right, observation, culturally rich. 
Um, and what I love, just to tie it to some of the research, is we are starting to see this in some of the research. For anyone who's interested, University, I'm not connected to them, just sharing, University of Pennsylvania Social Impact of the Arts Project has done some research looking at communities that are culturally rich, that have high cultural resources, and the, the different outcomes. So just something to kind of pick up uh, on that if you want to continue looking at that. Now, we only have time, sadly, for about one more question. But before I do my last question, I'm going to first just ask, is there one thing you might be working on at the intersection of arts and health that you want to briefly share with everyone that you're excited about, any one thing you're excited about that you just want to mention, a project, an initiative, a book? <laughs> book, yes. Um, at the end of January, I put together a 41-chapter anthology that covers the breadth of the, of, of the field of arts and health, from, went through artists, researchers, um, institutions, both cultural and healthcare. Um, Stacy has a beautiful chapter in the book, and uh, I'm very excited about that. It's been a labor of love, and uh, and I think it will be a. I think it'll also be a nice um, kind of a, a you know a, a, it could be a textbook actually because it covers kind of all of this the pillars. Wow. Incredible! You heard it here first, so keep your eyes peeled for January. Just one thing, huh? No. Uh -oh. There's so much, the, I mean, the NEA, I mean, they're doing so, time so much. I know, and he's trying to be like, get to your last question. But any one thing oh, you want to pick up. Oh, Asal Habib, Habibi has a chapter. Are you still here? Yes. Oh, she Yay. has a great chapter. Oh, my gosh. So, and you're both close to each other. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, yeah. being, and, and yes, working with the World Health Organization is huge. Yes, I mean, of course. And I'm, and Chris Bailey has a chapter. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. but in any case, it's, it's exciting, and, and working with Chris directly is going to be a, a make it for a wonderful year. Thank so, you. Um, it's, well, it, ha it hasn't even really been announced yet, uh, but Music in Mind is in the title. Mm. Okay. okay. Music in Mind. So I, I would just say quickly, um, the work that we're doing and have been doing with creative forces in the military mm. that's focused on trauma mm. and has been... Um, very focused just on military populations. I I'm, I'm, have been for years very eager to understand what are the applications in other settings where one has to deal with trauma. So, you know, whether it's natural disasters or whether it's man made disasters, whether it's persistent poverty, you know, what are the places where what we are learning that has been so well documented and refined? within military settings, how can that be beneficial to other populations that are dealing with trauma? So I'm very excited about that. Wow, amazing. All right, as we close, any thoughts about where do we go from here? I mean, we've talked about and uplifted so much incredible work happening, but we also know there's still room to grow. So in arts and health, as you look ahead, what do you see as either a step we need to take or an opportunity out there? What's something uh, that you think, where do you think you, we're going in arts and health? Anything else? What can we do? I'd love to see um, something as simple as an art care app embedded in um, all of our sort of insurance companies' websites that can connect people to local arts organizations that are there to serve them in terms of health, and that can be licensed therapeutic help, it could be a stroke choir, it could be free park passes for anybody with these requirements. So that's, that's something we have pulled together, a lot of organizations that can s help us supply that. We just have to find the vendor who would want to have this on their website, say. Um, but I also think that um, growing the, the data bases that are available to researchers um, so that we can really kind of ramp up the validated research uh, that will enable us to kind of take major steps in funding and in, in um, reimbursement for therapeutic values. So that I'm excited about that possibility. So I think riffing on what you just shared, Renee, I'm really interested in uh, where there's evidence of social prescribing. So, uh, you know, where it is that healthcare providers are encouraging people to engage in the arts as part of their wellness. And I wonder if that can translate into insurance covering that or, you know, finding ways of supporting that. 
Um, that's interesting to me. And I think the, the, other, the other piece, I think, has to do with paving the pathways for artists and arts organizations to truly intersect with the health sector uh, in durable ways. And I know that there are some ways that that happened now, but we need so many more. And we need to cultivate the next generations of people who are eager to work at those intersections. Yes. Thank you so much. Can you please just join me in thanking Renee Fleming and Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson for an incredible day. Thank you. Thank you.